First of all, let me say welcome back Huskies. That sounds really nice. Let's give each other a round of applause for being here today. Um, if I've not met you yet, my name's Deborah Bouton. I uh, recently was uh, Chief of Staff and Senior Woman Administrator here at NIU. I've um, taken a position at Marshall University uh, a few months ago, so I am in a bit of a homecoming just like you all, which is fantastic. Um, when I was leaving, one of the things I mentioned to our athletic director is that I would like to finish the job here and have this wonderful event and host it for you all. So super happy to be back. Um, and this is going to be an amazing morning. We're going to talk a lot about our history, our accomplishments. We have a really fantastic panel that's going to really um, put some faces to the history of our athletic department as it relates to women's sports and Title IX and all the places we've been. You know, this is a special weekend. Homecoming is always so wonderful. Um, we had a wonderful homecoming, I mean, Hall of Fame on Thursday night. Um, obviously, yesterday was, you know, we had a great day. It was a beautiful weather. And despite the outcome of yesterday's football game, you know, one of the things I think is super important about our relationships in sports is just the relationships. Um, you hear a lot of time, you know, I didn't remember the wins, I didn't remember the losses, but I re what I remembered was the relationships I made when I was playing my sport. And so again, despite maybe the outcome of yesterday's football game, the relationships are what matter. And watching the women come back and see each other and, and hug each other, I just think that's the core of what this is all about. So uh, this has been an amazing weekend. Um, Real quick, I know Sean's gonna do this, so I'll do this real quick. I wanna honor my husband. Thank you, Dale Bouton, for being here. Yeah. I was at a conference uh, recently and someone suggested that when you're in this business and there's a lot of administrators and coaches in here that you tell your spouse, significant other, it's a one, two, three event. One, I need you there. Two, if you want to. And three, you're good. Well, this was a one for us today, so thank you for making the time for that. Um, I also just wanted to uh, recognize a few people before I bring Sean up and uh, Dr. Freeman. You know, when we put this uh, event together, um, I tried to put together a panel of really just amazing folks that could really tell the story of our history in the past 50, really plus years, 60 years almost. And it could only be as big as it could be. Um, and so inevitably we were going to miss some people who have such amazing stories. So I wanted to just recognize a few people. Um, Debbie Brew, where are you Debbie? You know, she was our, go ahead, yeah, this is big. You know, she was the second volleyball coach of our history. She was here coaching from 75 to 81. And you know, that was a time before Title IX was passed and all the things that happened before that. I just think it's amazing that the women that came before, there was federal law to do this thing, how hard they worked, how much time they put in. Um, so Debbie, thank you for your leadership and being a community member even since, and thank you very much. Um, we've got a really big deal in here as well. Lugene Moyer is visiting with us. Where are you, Lugene? Hey, bar hey girl. Yeah really the matriarch of what we have built here. I know everyone's passed the baton, um, and really Lou Jean and Mary Bell were two of the first. I mean, again, there's so many women in here that have been impacted by the lives of those two women and continue to. Um, so thank you for being here. Uh, Dee Abrahamson, where's Dee? Hey Dee, yeah. Right, similarly, um, such a leader in our industry, uh, such a leader here at NIU. She passed the baton to me when I assumed her position and I couldn't have been more thankful for what she did for me. And really, again, building the platform for what we're doing today and what we'll hopefully do in the future. Dee also was super uh, helpful in this preparing this event. Like I mentioned, I'm not at NIU anymore, so kind of doing it from afar was a little bit challenging. So Dee, thank you for your leadership in getting this off and going, so thanks. 
I also want to quickly mention Bobby Cesarek. You know, Bobby was here when I first got to NIU, and she had an amazing career as a gymnastics coach. Um, really, as the two uh, departments combined, and really led us through a lot of that. And really, again, I think passed the baton to the next coaches, Sam Morreale and others, right? And really uh, established NIU gymnastics. And so I wanted to recognize you as well. Thank you. Thank you. And two other real quick. Sally Stevens and Joyce Angotti. I mean, are they super fans of women's sports or what? <laughs> yeah. We can always count on them to be there. I don't know, you know, when we have gone up in the stands after games, I know women's basketball does that on occasion. To see her and Joyce, Sally, with those smiles on their faces, sometimes I don't even know if they know who won. But they're so pleasant and such great advocates for us, so thank you. I wanted to make sure you all were here. I kept asking, well, is Sally and Joyce going to be here? Have we invited them yet? So thank you for that. Yep. All right, I'm going to have Sean come up uh, real quick, and then obviously President Freeman. Um, you know, when Sean got here, now in his 10th year, which is amazing, we, were, we had a lot of things rolling. And um, I was here, and it was an incredible experience to have him come in and really, again, this whole baton passing, I think it'll be a theme today, and really raise the level and continue to pay attention to the things that we need to pay attention to to keep raising, our, uh, raising the bar on all, across all sports, but particularly on the women's side. I don't know if you all have seen the new tennis facility, not new, new to us, um, but that's an amazing accomplishment, something we haven't had for a long time. Um, and a tremendous asset, um, so thank you for that. And again, appreciate Sean allowing me to come back and finish this up. Um, without further ado, let's bring him up here and thank you very much. Thanks, Deb. Um, first off, you cannot talk about women's athletics here at NIU during my tenure and not talk about Deb Bouton. So please, let's give her a round of applause just to all the work, all the hard work that she, that she has done and uh, will do as she transitions to, uh, to Marshall. But thank you, Deb. Uh, this was our brainchild. We talked about the best way to talk about the significance of Title IX and the 50th anniversary. And, uh, we we're definitely in lockstep about making sure it was done right. And I really appreciate her attention to detail, uh, her leadership, uh, and quite frankly, her get it done mentality. You know, that is something that I'm going to miss here, uh, but we'll make sure that she's a phone call away to help us to continue uh, our goals and objectives. This first off, you know, this is uh, interesting times that, uh, that we're in right now. A lot of transformational change, a lot of things that are going on in our country, on, on our uh, institutions, campuses. Uh, but this passage, this federal law, Title IX, has done a lot uh, for women and quite frankly, to create access and opportunities. Uh, I spent a, a lifetime making sure that equality is job one. I know that well, I live it, uh, and quite frankly, uh, it's about a commitment all the time, not half the time, all the time. So really passionate in that particular area, and I've actually seen it done quite well here at NIU. So welcome, welcome. It's great to see so many coaches, student athletes, this is a great venue for it. We're probably get, uh, going to be needing more, much more seats as we continue the tradition of celebrating Title IX and equity across the board. All right, since the Title IX federal civil rights law has passed in June 8, 72, there, there has been many positive changes to provide equal access and equal opportunities for women. It's extremely important to know our history to be able to shape our future. 
And to that end, we have a chance today to hear from our very own NIU Trail Blazers. This is indeed a celebration and a time of much reflection. Equal access and opportunities only come when there is commitment and leadership. I'm truly humbled to be in my position as Director of Athletics and deeply appreciate the proud history of women's athletics. As a, and as an athletic department, we are also thankful for the brave and fearless women who provided the foundation for the academic and athletic success that you see today. I really appreciate being here this morning and for, and for supporting our journey. I'll also say that this has been a, a passionate trip as I've got to, got to really know our beginnings. So I'm not gonna steal the thunder of our, of our panelists, but I'll just say that we have a real proud tradition of women's athletics and as well as access and opportunities. So as I transition a bit, I wanna introduce our fearless leader, a person that I count as a friend, a colleague, and someone who epitomizes leadership. So without any further ado, Dr. Freeman, please come to the, the, I was about to call her something else, but I would say that Dr. Lisa Freeman has done so much for us in athletics, so my emotions have taken over a little bit, so thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Sean, my partner, not in crime, but in leading change. I so appreciate you. And thank you, Deb. I think the fact that you're here today leading this event is just testament to the fact that, you know, you never get to leave the Husky family. Once a Husky, always a Husky. Let's give Deb another round of applause. Everyone in this room knows that in 1972, the federal civil rights law, Title IX, removed barriers for girls and women in education and in sports. I wasn't a student athlete, but I wouldn't be standing here without Title IX. I graduated from veterinary school in 1986 in a class that was half men and half women. Prior to Title IX, Every veterinary school in the country allowed in two women only, so they could be lab partners and they didn't have to bother the men who were really supposed to be there. So I wouldn't be here without Title IX. Title IX accelerated change. You can clap, that's okay. <laughs> Title IX accelerated change and created a legacy of diverse women leading on and off the court and playing field. Today we've come together to celebrate that legacy and to honor Husky women champions along with the individuals who contributed to their advancement and success. And I am so proud of our university's legacy. NIU has been recognized repeatedly for our commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging and our progress at building a community where all feel welcome, included, and valued. In just the past two years, we were acknowledged or awarded by Campus Pride, great colleges to work for, the American Association of Colleges and Universities, Insight into Diversity Magazine, and the NCAA and Minority Opportunities Athletic Association. We are at the cutting edge of leading in equity, inclusion, and belonging, and that is worth applauding. Those recognitions, that leadership doesn't happen without courageous leadership from individuals and continued advocacy for justice and equal rights. Strong shoulders to stand on and generations of leaders who are willing to take on the work. When I look around this room, and I wish you could see the view that I see right now, I see Husky Trailblazers sitting next to Active Voices for Change, and I am inspired by all of you. All of you who refuse to accept the limitations that are put on you by others. All of you who are unafraid to challenge the status quo, 
and all of you who are willing to advocate for unpopular but just ideas. When I look at you, I am inspired and optimistic about our boundless future. It is an honor to be with you here today to celebrate Title IX. Go Huskies! All right, we're ready for our panel. So this thing needs to go down. Who's taking this? You doing it? All right, we'll get our panel up here. Come on, panelists, let's do this. Everybody hear me? Am I back on? Great. What's the order? I'm the wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> really close to you. I'm the wrong place. All right, everybody. Everybody ready? Let me just say, like I mentioned before, this panel, um, I couldn't have dreamed up a better group of individuals to really tell the story of NIU athletics and NIU. And President Freeman, thank you for your words, um, your, cur your courage um, and leadership. You've carried this tradition, and so, and so thank you. We're inspired by you. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time introducing these fabulous people. Some of you might know them. Uh, you're going to get to know them really, really well here soon. I'm going to introduce them uh, uh, quickly, and then we'll start the panel. I figure that'll be a little better uh, flow. Um, before I introduce them, though, we had a Zoom call. Mm, when was that? Friday, last Thursday? Something like that? Ten days ago. And to watch everyone on the little squares, you know, we did that during the pandemic, and that was awful but fun um, saw everybody on the squares and everyone got to share their stories with each other and I think it was super inspiring so I, kn I know you'll feel that today so we'll start I'll introduce everybody first and foremost Dr. Ann Kaplan um, I'm gonna read this I'm not a big reader as far as if I'd like to go off the cuff but these things I can't mess up um, she was a primary strategist for first a dean then provost, and then several university presidents here at NIU. In her 46 years of service at NIU, she was instrumental in the high visibility establishment of the College of Engineering and Engineering Technology, the NIU Board of Trustees, and the outreach campuses of Hoffman Estates, Rockford, and Naperville. But perhaps Anne's greatest legacy as university vice president is her contributions to the humanity of the university's workings, including childcare, University Support Service Staffs, the Division of Art, Outreach, Engagement, and Regional Development, as well as her leadership super, uh, overseeing athletics. You'll hear more about that in a minute. It's fantastic. All right, Ann Kaplan. <laughs> Carrie Groth. It's a little emotional for me. She's big time. Um, Two-sport athlete at NIU, playing tennis and basketball, served NIU for 23 years, first as a women's tennis coach, and then as an administrator, and ultimately as the director of athletics from 1994 to 2004. Listen up, when she was only one of three female athletic directors at the FBS level. One of three. Okay. You know, we think about the history of NIU athletics, this is a big move, such an impact, and early. Um, some of her most significant accomplishments include rejoining the Mid-American Conference. You all may not know, we weren't always a member of the MAC, so thank you for getting us back in there. Overseeing and planning the construction of the Convocation Center, this very building we're in, right here, is because of her. 
hiring legendary football coach Joe Novak. We know how that's ended up. And commissioning a change in adoption of our current Husky logo. There's a story there too. Carries an inductee of numerous national halls of fame, including the Mid-American Conference in 2022 and the Husky Hall of Fame in 2009. Let's give it up for Carrie. <laughs> Donna Martin, another two-sport athlete, sees a, see a theme here, <laughs> playing an NI, playing a field hockey and softball. She also served as head coach and assistant coach for the NIU softball program for 26 years. There's some longevity here at this stage. Winning two Mid-American Conference West titles in 99 and 2000, and advancing to the NCAA Regionals in 1996 as head coach, and served as an assistant coach for the Huskies when NIU advanced to the 1998 Women College World Series. 1988, did I say 88? Did I say 98? Did I say 2008? <laughs> 2028, let's go, softball! <laughs> Donna was twice inducted to the NIU Hall of Fame, first in 1992 for field hockey, and then for, in 2002 for softball. Donna Martin. We got out of order. We don't know how to count. As be me, sorry. <laughs> Gail Lohr, um, amazing person. Another two sport athlete at NIU competing in the pre Title IX era, 1973 1977 in field hockey and basketball. She spent her career as a teacher, coach, and administrator at Deerfield High School, where she posted 24 winning seasons in her 26 year softball coaching career. Gail is a three time Hall of Famer having been inducted here in 1987 into the Illinois Girls Coaches Association in 2002 and the Illinois Coaches Association for Softball in 2004. Gail, one sec, I want to tell one story about Gail. She could possibly be the most amazing alumnus we have so far. We'll see if some other people are like, you know, I want to be more amazing. She came up to me at the Hall of Fame ceremony for D. Abrahamson in 2018. And she said, you know, from 1961 to 1981, women didn't receive letters at NIU. Can you believe that? The women sitting out there, student athletes are like, I get a letter jacket, I get a pen, I get a jacket, I get the things. But before we were combined athletic departments, we didn't award letters to the women that competed at NIU. And she says, you know what? We need to fix that. And I said, sounds great, Gail. Can you help me? <laughs> and she said, yes. And so we were able to have a legacy event here in 2019. Some of you will hear back for it. And we were able to award letters to the women that competed here those two decades. And besides today, that was one of the most amazing events of my entire career working in this business. Watching those women come up and receive a letter and things that we take it for, for granted. Um, so thank you, my friend. It was fantastic. My friend, Connie T. Berry. Hello. Hello. <laughs> you guys, if you don't know Connie T. Berry, this is the real deal. Competed as an elite high jumper at Kansas State, 1989 to 1992. She later represented the US in the 1996 Olympics. Raise your hand if you've ever been in the Olympics. Raise your hand, Connie. <laughs> right? And then after the Olympics, she said, well, that's not enough. She said, I'll come to NIU. During her tenure as head coach at NIU track and field, the Huskies have broken 121 school records. This is it. Won 38 MAC titles. Qualified 58 times for the NCAA regionals. Sent seven individuals to the NCAA championships. Won the indoor and outdoor championship in the same year. <sighs> huh? And cross country. Someone needed to edit this for me. She's a Hall of Famer in Kansas State Hall of, Kansas State Hall of Fame and also the St. Louis Sports Hall of Fame. Connie T. Berry. <laughs> Ray Gooden. I had to get some mail words and leadership up here, so my choice, Ray Gooden. Yes, Ray. What's up, everybody? Hey, Ray. Yep. 
He's been the head volleyball coach for 21 seasons at NIU, winning three Mid-American Conference Championships on his way to a fourth one this year. Uh, participating in two NCAA tournaments, earning five Mid-American Conference Coach of the Year awards. He's NIU's all-time winningest volleyball coach with 340 wins, well, 341 or two. You know, this, is, this was written a few days ago. Um, in addition to his five AVCA All-Americans and three academic All-Americans at NIU, Ray has coached USA volleyball teams on seven international trips. Coach Ray Gooden. Kristen Hoffman, just had a big weekend. <laughs> Newly inducted member into the NIU Athletics Hall of Fame and one really one of the most accomplished student athletes at NIU. Played setter on the volleyball team from 2008 to 2011, which included a trip to the NCAA tournament her senior year. An All-American, two-time academic All-American, All-Mac, All-Mac setter of the year are just a few accolades leading up to her 2012 NCAA Woman of the Year nomination and the Mid-American Conference and award of an NCAA Postgraduate Scholarship. Kristen's impact on our campus and community was not just on the court. She was known for her leadership and community service, participating in AmeriCorps program called Students in Service. Kristen Hoffman. John A., my girl, last but not least. You all know John A., yes? Yeah, here we go. John A. Is, in her current, is a current women's basketball student athlete in her seventh year with the Huskies. Fantastic. She's a workhorse on our women's basketball team playing in every game last season. And in the past two seasons received the MAC Sixth Player of the Year Award and both all-conference and academic all-conference accolades. Number 22 is best known for leading the MAC and in being in national statistics for three-pointers. I think she had 23 points yesterday in the game against the Huskies and shot like 70-something percent from the field. So we have really high hopes for you, Johnny. Johnny Poisson. All right, you ready? All right, Anne, you're first. Make sure we're ready for the microphones. I think they may come out or I think they may not. There we go. All right, Anne, for you. Uh, maybe, let's see, test it out. Hello. 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 All right, Louder. here we go. So, Anne. I'd like you to share with our audience your first job at NIU and how this position intersected with the passage of Title IX and how your impact on what you've called the impossible committee would set the tone for how NIU would accept and adopt this historic piece of civil rights legislation. Well, my first job at NIU had nothing to do with Title IX. I was an administrative assistant in a college called Continuing Edu Education, which was itself only about a year old when I got here. And my memory of the whole Title IX committee starts with one night in my kitchen when I'm trying to cook dinner, I get a phone call from the president's office. That was absolutely astonishing. I mean, I had been there less than four years. Uh, <laughs> I was very new at Northern. I was, in fact, busily trying to leave. <laughs> so, you know, but, so I get this phone call. It's from John Gardner, who was the assistant to President Nelson. John Gardner wants to know if I would be willing to serve on an impossible committee. Well, now, it's surprising enough to have the president's office call when you're cooking dinner. but. I didn't know anything about this. He tells me they've got to put together a Title IX committee because we've got to be in compliance by July of 78. Well, now it's now 77, so you can see this is a bit of a problem. So, and I said to John, I don't know anything about athletics. That was certainly true. I hadn't been in any sports in high school. We didn't have any women's sports in high school. I had avoided all things athletic in college. And so, so I'm, say, I'm telling him this. Well, you, I can see in retrospect, um, those, there were two Title IX committees. They had collectively 18 people on them. They had half and half men and women. That part was 
semi-easy, but of course they had to have a bunch of people from athletics and they had to have a bunch of people from the College of Education and the Department of Physical Education, which was where women's athletics was, and that used up a lot of spots. And then they had to have a few people who didn't have a vested interest in what was going on. So I was real good at that. I certainly <laughs> didn't have a vested interest in what was going on. And so, so I get on this committee. My committee is chaired by Wilma Strickland, who was then the chair of the management department, and one of the probably five or six smartest <laughs> administrators I ever worked with. But you can learn a lot uh, if you can shut up on a committee where you don't know anything. And so, so we go through all this and we got it done. I mean, Wilma was a whiz at managing a committee and pulling diverse views together. And we got the report turned in. And this was in 19, by then, 1978, which was a kind of uh, transitional year in Nor at Northern because President Nelson resigned, Provost Manat became the acting president, the associate provost became the acting provost, and then they had to fill up slots in the provost's office. So Wilma Strickland became the acting associate provost, and I became the acting assistant to the provost. So having started at Northern four years previously, knowing absolutely nothing about athletics, I end up, because of the Title IX committee, in the provost's office, and I never left. I went from one end of, the pro of Loudon Hall to the other for my entire career. So I believe I owe a great deal to Title IX. <laughs> and certainly um, to the people who were on it. I mean, it, it, was, um, it was an interesting experience in, in just watching how these various interests got negotiated out. And it's certainly interesting looking back to see how it all turned out so far. Thanks, Ann. Appreciate you. My turn. Gary's turn. This is going to be amazing. I can't wait. Um, discuss a little bit your time as director of athletics, your relationship with the amazing Dr. Ann Kaplan, and what I think is going to be really interesting is sharing your experience when you served on the National Commission on the Opportunity Athletics. This is a federal commission which occurred after the 30th anniversary of Title IX. So Carrie, the stage is yours. Well, first of all, I have to say I love Northern Illinois University. And if it wasn't for Northern Illinois University, I would not have had an amazing career in athletics. So thank you. And thank you for inviting me back. I appreciate it. So what was the question? I'm kidding. <laughs> So, in 1994, first of all, I'm going to back up just a little bit. In 1989, we were still separate programs, men's athletics and women's athletics. And then President LaTourette decided there was an opportunity to hire an athletics director that was going to integrate the men's and women's programs into one. And an athletic director was hired. And because the NCAA required all Division I institutions to have a senior woman administrator, I was offered that position. I was senior associate athletics director under Gerald O'Dell and an SWA, very important position at that time. So if the NCAA had not done that, and if Northern had not accepted that role within an athletics program, I would not be here today. I might still be here as tennis coach, but I wouldn't be sitting here maybe having the, the career I had. But in 1994, um, Dr. Kaplan did tell me I was at the women's Final Four. I called her and I said, I'm interested in the AD job. And our athletic director, Gerald O'Dell, had just left to be the athletic director at Cincinnati. And she said, whatever you do, don't be the interim. Remember that call? So I didn't, and I worked really hard to put myself in a position to apply during the national search. And they were supposed to make a decision, and two weeks later I'm still hanging out there, and I just knew I didn't get the, 
the job. And it was because our president was going through a very difficult time trying to assess the damage if he were to hire a girl back then. I'm sure of that. He hired me, offered me the position, and that was two weeks later, and the damage control began. The board at that time of regents that oversaw Illinois institutions, certain institutions really went after our president for my hiring and tried to fire him, I believe, tried to get him out. And it was not a good time, but he stood by me and he stood by the decision. And so that's another feather in the cap for NIU. I became the third woman at this level and today there are still less than 10. That is almost 30 years later. It's, it's not very good. So we still have a long way to go. But the first decision I had to make was to fire the football coach. Okay, I'm a girl, according to many men who really didn't think that women could manage football. And then I had to fire our football coach who was really a disgrace to this institution, to be honest with you. And we did, we fired him, and we moved forward on a national search, and that's when we hired Joe Novak. Brought him on campus for three days, let the whole community interview him and three other candidates. And he was a game changer. Thank God we did not have social media. <laughs> Because when I was on the football field, as we were 0 and 23, 0 and 23, I would have never made it, nor would have Joe. Because social media has changed the face of a lot of things in this country, but particularly, you can lose your job if that movement goes. But that made a huge difference because all sports are important, but football is the fall sport and kicks off the year. And if football is not successful, sometimes that's the way the year goes with all of your sports. So we were lucky when we beat Central Michigan to end the longest losing record. That really turned around this program, not only for the football program, but for all of our programs. Fortunately, at the time, women's basketball was pulling us through, going to NCAA championships and and really picking it up as, long, as well as women's volleyball as well. But football, when you have football, really has to set the stage. So it's an interesting time, and I think it all goes down to relationships and who you hire and making sure you have the right people on your bus, I guess it is, and that goes for your friendships and your work relationships, is making sure that you surround yourself with good people who share the same ideals to move forward at such a fine institution. Thank you, Carrie. All right, Donna, we're gonna have you spend a little time telling a story about when you were a student athlete. Um, and this was 1971, 1981. So really early in the putting the pieces together. I know, it's okay, the years are the years. 77 to 81, don't make me older. I'm telling you what, I gave you guys to read this. You didn't read it. All right. 77, sorry. Um, being one of the first in the class to receive an athletic scholarship to attend NIU, and then specifically about your story about what you observed on campus and uh, being an advocate um, for change with you and your teammates. It's a really super story. Oh, thank you, Deborah. I feel old enough, but 71 is way before my time. Hey, 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 it's not so bad. <laughs> And let's give another round of applause for Deborah for putting this thing together. Um, PE voice, sorry. Uh, most, of the time, most of us in this room have been a part of a team or a group of people. Is that true? Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about psychology here, but a group goes through stages of development, forming, storming, anybody else? Norming, <laughs> performing, there you go. Good job, president. Well, I 
came to Northern in the fall of 77, which I think started the storming part of being a group in athletics, and I'm gonna say also in the physical education department, because when I came to campus, that was, I think, maybe the second year that the PE departments were merged, women and men, right? So, um, so I kind of look at my journey through this experience, through that kind of forming, storming. I think we're still in the norming part and maybe back in storming, but um, although Title IX, as Dr. Kaplan said, you know, it took a little while to be implemented throughout, you know, like, it was like 10 years, right? Yeah, for that to happen. And I was in that 1978. I didn't know you then, but had I known you, I'd have knocked your door down <laughs> to come and talk to you about it. But uh, during a skills class in the fall of 77, uh, I came to class and I, was, I came from high school, we were separated, you know, women, uh, girls and boys. And so I just thought it was college that had men and women in the, class, in the classroom at the same time. So I was in a softball skills class and um, we were having a, a test that day on game performance or whatever. I was on second base, sharply hit ball, was hit to left field. The left fielder fielded it, threw a strong throw to third base. I rounded third, turned around to look for the ball, and it was on my nose. So I broke my nose and had stitches. I got back from the health center because I had field hockey practice that afternoon, and I was figuring out how I was going to tell Coach Bolger that I'd broken my nose. And we had a big game, and we were in the middle of some big, long winning streak, and I was a freshman, and I was like... But when I got back to Anderson Hall, I was approached by several people and they asked me about how this happened and how I felt about it. And I think it was because the left fielder was a guy, a male, and the person at third base to receive the ball was a female. And she flinched, pulled her glove away, and that's why I got hit. And I assured them that had it been me at third, I would have caught it. <laughs> but I think, you know, they were, they were very worried about whether I was going to sue them or not, or whether it was the right thing to have uh, co-ed skills classes. So that's a, a bit outside of the athletic realm, but they were going through some of those same storming issues uh, with Title IX and having to have e equity for males and females. Facilities and time for classes and who was going to teach the classes and so forth. So um, in athletics, we were becoming more, as, as student athlete, the longer I was at Northern, we became way more um, aware of the some of the inequities that was happening on campus. Uh, you know, we had to, we didn't have any practice clothes. We had to supply our own practice clothes. We had to wash our own uniforms. We had one uniform, and we had to wash them between each game. Remember that, Betty? Ooh. Um, so our coaches were trying very hard to, to get more things for us and more opportunities and push for equity and budgeting. And we kept hearing that there was no money tree. And I can appreciate that because it kind of got dumped on administrators. You now have to supply all of this, these things for both sexes. And, and they didn't really have any money dumped on them as well. So it basically meant, though, that they weren't ready to, they weren't willing to decide that football didn't need 105 scholarships and that basketball could really play with 15 people on, in their, on their rosters. Um, so there were some difficult decisions to be made uh, and we understood that, but we still deserve, you know, that, that same piece of the pie, I guess. So 
they would get, my coaches got their uh, schedules approved through administration. That was kind of their way of saying we are kind of equitable. However, they didn't give them the funds. So that's kind of like getting a car with no keys to start it. So we had a schedule in case in point, uh, I think it was my junior or senior year, we were supposed to play in a tournament, a fall ter softball tournament in, uh, at Northwestern. And so all of the student, all the softball players, all myself and my teammates, we had to give a dollar. And then our coach, D. Abrahamson, matched our dollars so that we could pay our portion of the umpire fees to play at Northwestern. Because of course they didn't have any money either to, they, even though they were hosting, you know, to, to cover that cost. So we were, we had to pitch in. If we wanted to play, we had to pay. And it seems like a dollar, but it's still a bit of a buy-in, I guess. Uh, we practiced typically if we were in season from four to six in the evening, afternoons after class. And this is the big part that Deborah loves. Um, and when we got done at six, the, the dorm cafeteria is closed at six. So our, it, our coaches and the, and the players were like, is there any way we can keep a dorm, you know, keep the dorm open until 6.30, 6.15, something like that? And uh, we were told no. And then we found out that the football team was having dinner after practice in the Black Hawk cafeteria in Home Student Center. And so with a little help from some of the coaches and um, a couple of administrators, you're laughing, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Debbie Brew, um, we gathered a few women's athletes and we went to training table with the football team. So we went over, got our trays, got in line, and went through training table. Well, the football coach was not happy, um, and I don't blame him. I, I would not have been happy either uh, if I were that coach. Uh, just to backtrack one little bit, we had a, uh, I had a field hockey teammate, Nancy Pagoni, and she worked for the Northern Star, so she arranged to have a photographer um, at the event, which was very helpful when the coach started yelling at us that we couldn't, what are you doing? You can't be here. And we said, well, we need a place to eat too. So we need to have something, you know, to eat. And so he, and then click, click, click. And, you know, it, that was our social media at the time. Um, but it was a good backup for what we had going on. But needless to say, it got us a, um, an invitation to meet with President Monat the next day. And I wasn't sure if we were going to get yelled at. You know, but, you know, in the words of, of our late uh, John Lewis, you know, good trouble is sometimes necessary trouble. So we met with Dr. Monat. We communicated back and forth. And after that, one of the dorms stayed open till 6.15 or 6.30. And you could, or you could get a sack lunch or a sack meal at lunchtime that you could have at dinner. So baby steps, but it was um, some steps in the right direction. We have a ways to go, but I was very, I had a lot of fun in my time at NIU and in 30 years, I, I, I played, started in 77 and I retired from the athletic department in 2007. So 30 years and, and like Carrie, you know, I love this place and I wanna see it grow. And I want to see you, most of you ladies in this room, um, push for and don't take your foot off the gas. Thanks, Donna. I like the photographer, right? Yeah. Bring a photographer with you everywhere you go. He was a lifesaver. No doubt. <laughs> Saved our butt. All right, Gail. Let's, let's pivot a little bit, talk about high school. Uh, you know, I mentioned Gail spent her professional career in high school. 
Um, so if you could share with us you know, your observation of participation at the high school level, sports, skills, fan engagement, and how maybe all of those resources and um, opportunities have helped propel where we are today. Thank you, Deborah. I want to thank the people who put this event on today and appreciate Deborah's uh, hard work. And I know I'm just one of those of us in the room who'd like to wish her all the best at Marshall University. So thank you, Deborah. <clears throat> I'm going to use my notes because if I don't, I'll keep talking forever because my life has been surrounded and uh, reflected in Title IX. Because I'm just a little bit younger than Deborah or the, than Donna, uh, a little older than Donna. <laughs> Not by much, by four years. So, you know, come on. Um, so back in the late 70s, I want to tell you about the state of girls athletics here in Illinois. 12 different sporting opportunities, that's it. We were limited in contest by the IHSA. I believe when I coached volleyball my first year, we were allowed 12 volleyball matches and 18 softball games. There was discrimination, there's no doubt. The discrimination was in facility usage, uniforms, quality of officiating, support services, practice times, facilities. We didn't have home and away uniforms. And we didn't have warm-ups. Well, you might have had a warm-up if the guys got new ones and they passed theirs on to you. Physical conditioning and weight training was not supported by parents or coaches. Most females were ridiculed if they lifted weights. This is not in my notes, but I'm gonna tell you when I was at Northern and I had to come prepared for field hockey to be in good condition, during the summer, I would run in the dark because I didn't want to be seen running. It wasn't acceptable. Spectators consisted of parents and maybe a couple friends, and when they clapped, it echoed. Actually, that was the same when I was here at Northern, too, at least for basketball. School and local newspapers rarely covered our contest. And if there were pictures in the paper, you know what they were of? Women smiling, the girls celebrating. Never was there a picture of a female showing strength or being athletic. off-season competition only for a few sports. These were the days of GAA, Girls Athletic Association and Intramurals. So basically what happened in high schools at that time is if you had female PE teachers who were dedicated and enthusiastic, they would offer more GAA programs and intramural programs. And if you didn't have those staff members at your high school, there was really nothing for you to do. Many schools had no interest in promoting female sports as they believed it would take money and facilities away from the boys' programs. And at that time, the athletic directors who were making those decisions were all males. Until there was pressure from athletes, parents, coaches, or athletic administrators who believed in equity, Title IX was largely ignored and very slow to be implemented by many high, school, high schools here in the state. But I'll tell you, if there was a school in your area that had a formal complaint made to the OCR, that seemed to get administrators' attention. And compliance to Title IX began to change. A review by the OCR would always turn up in equities, and not just in athletics that would cost school districts a lot of money. So no athletic director ever wanted to be reviewed by the OCR. Fast forward to today, most of you know, we're at 19 different sporting opportunities at high school here in Illinois. Outside high school season participation has boomed for us. There's leagues, individual skill training, 
Most sports can participate all year round. Multiple opportunities for coaching clinics. When I first started, there weren't coaching clinics for females. The skill set is amazing what happens now. In 1973, when I graduated from high school and attended Northern, I went out for field hockey, but I had never played field hockey. Oh, in PE class, that was it. Basketball, my senior year in high school was the very first year that IHSA would allow us to play basketball. I was a starter at Northern in both sports as a freshman having hardly any activity or any previous experience. That is unheard of now. Athletic events are now covered in the paper and through live streaming. It's now acceptable for females to look athletic and strong in pictures. I realize you didn't ask for my opinion um, on what kind of work is left to do, but I probably will never have this opportunity again, so I'm going for it. We've gone from almost all female coaches to now males seeking out coaching positions for female sports. In general, when I f first started coaching and as an administrator at Deerfield, men didn't want to coach the girls. The only time they did is when they didn't get the coaching position for boys. That attitude has changed, thank goodness. And now many men prefer coaching females over males. I still believe very strongly that females need female role models. I'm fearful that the decline of women in leadership positions and roles as coaches and athletic administrators will have a lasting negative impact. I like carry in the administrative end, there are very few at the high school level athletic administrators that are females, and that has not changed much either. We need to work in recruiting and retaining females. I think there's things we can do, they just haven't been done and we need to get at them. Second thing, my experience is that coaches pay, and this is at Deerfield in the Central Suburban League, Coaches pay, practice time, support services, facilities, quality of coaching are pretty equal. But I know that that's not the case all over <laughs> Illinois and certainly I live in rural Wisconsin. Whew. I, I, I just can hardly keep my mouth shut when I go watch some of the games. There are facility discrepancies and I think often it's between softball and baseball because they don't share the same facility. Lastly, there may be inequities in the area of budgets between girls and boys sports. Football can throw off the balance because of equipment that's very expensive to take care of safety and their large numbers for their programs. Also, historically, they have a lot more coaches on their staff, which throws off actually the money aspect of it. Changes come, but we need to continue to pursue. Today, we have a generation of mothers who were athletes and many of them passing on, passing it on by coaching and encouraging their daughters to be a part of something really special. They join the fathers who often were high school athletes and understand the benefits of athletic participation. I'm gonna ask you, if you have ever coached Boys or girls, t-ball, Olympians, would you stand up? If you've ever coached, stand up. Give a round of applause to these people. Thank you. Thank you for giving back in a meaningful way. Thank you for making a positive impact on the life of others. I strongly believe that the passing of Title IX has made the United States a better place for females to live and to be successful. I feel blessed to have grown up in the era of Title IX. My life has been made better, and I've been rewarded over and over and over again due to my involvement in athletics. Lastly, I want to thank all those who came before me and paved the way, including many here at Northern. 
At the top of my list is Dr. Bell, Dr. Moyer, I'm so glad to see you today, and Dr. Bischoff. Thank you, and thank you for everything you do. Thanks, Gail, and amazing stories about the beginning, mm -hmm. and thank you for all of your leadership. Uh -oh. Now the current, let's go. So, Connie, I mentioned that she was an Olympian, the only one in the room, by the way. Um, you've competed at the highest level of sport and served as director of track and field cross country for almost two decades. If you wouldn't mind sharing us your experience competing at the 1996 Olympics. By the way, the 1996 Olympics was a big deal for women athletes. We won the most medals we had ever won on the women's side in 1996, track and field women's soccer, women's basketball. If you all haven't watched 37 Words documentary by ESPN, phenomenal. Check it out. It really was a breakout event for the daughters of Title IX, which, Connie, you would be one. And also your coaching experience is in IU, and you've seen the support over two decades and how that's grown here at NIU. Thank you, Deborah, and thank you for having us here. This is, um, once again, an event that I think needs to happen more often, not just on the 50th celebration, um, but we need to celebrate each other, you know, every day, every contest, every minute, every weight lift, all the time. If you can um, take a little journey with me, I'm going to go back to 1972. I was two. So the ladies on that side of the room, he was three. <laughs> <laughs> so the ladies on that side of the room set the stage for me. I didn't have to fight as hard as they did to get things in place as a student athlete. Um, coming up, my, my parents worked really hard, put me in a parochial school. So we were pushed to be in athletics. And that's because of the things that the ladies on this side of the room had set standard for and, and pushed for for us. Um, high school, grade school, college, not a bad coaching experience. I've only had one female coach in my life. Um, so all of my coaches were, were basically male, and the support that I received um, was, was astonishing. So that takes me into wanting to be professional. Graduated from Kansas State University, um, six-time All-American, um, because, again, of everything that came before um, with me being allowed to be a student athlete, me being allowed to be a tomboy and be okay with it. Um, I was taller than most female athletes, so all of my jeans kind of stopped in the middle of my, didn't have long pants back then. Um, you know, and, and, and that being okay, not being ridiculed for it. Um, so I was allowed to be a student athlete, a female African-American student athlete um, at that. Um, graduated from Kansas State and decided I wanted to become professional. So my first coaching job was actually a graduate assistant position at Kentucky. Um, I had a nursing degree from Kansas State and I just was using that to kind of catapult my uh, athletic career to the next level and to use their facilities. And ended up loving coaching. Um, but what I will say about that, my first real, my first full-time coaching position was at the University of Toledo. Uh, <laughs> too soon, I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but it was. That was my first opportunity given. Um, and just wanting to give back the opportunities that were given to me as a student athlete, watching the different things that others before me and educating myself on the different things that other female student athletes had to go through to help me get to the stage that I was at. So professionally, being able to make the Olympic team, um, like Deborah said, in the year where athletics for women was phenomenal. No, I didn't get a medal. But just to be there in Atlanta and to compete on that stage and to have my family be able to be in the stands in Atlanta to watch me compete 
um, was something that I will never forget. So now I'm gonna go a little bit backwards. So when I got here at NIU, um, mother of two, my husband was not here yet because there was not a lot here for an African-American male as far as jobs. Um, so I was by myself for the most part. The women in this room, Dee, Donna, Monique, EC, Sue Hansfield, if any of you know Sue Hansfield, they actually watched my children when I went to contest. If it were not for them and knowing where they had been and what it took for me to get on that stage and to get that head coaching position, I wouldn't be here 18 years later. You know, they helped me. It was, it was a village to, to raise children. Is that the, the, we had a village, a village of women that wanted to make sure I succeeded and encouraged me and made sure that when I needed help, you know, that, that I, was, I was able to get it. Cam, my oldest son, just put out a resume that Monique helped him do <laughs> for a job that he just applied for last week. Of course, we had to add a couple of things, but, you know, just making sure that female cultures are okay. Now, look in this athletic department. Look at our president. Look at our administration. And to have a sport AD that makes sure that diversity across the board is something that is seen and recognized and is in the forefront of what we do here at Northern Illinois University. I am honored to be on the stage with these women that have trailblazed for us on this side of the table. Thank you so much. Thanks, Connie. Okay, coach. Big wins this weekend. It's fun. So, Ray, you've been an ally for women's sports for most of your professional career. Uh, been leading our volleyball team for 21 seasons. Um, really an amazing advocate. So, would you share with our audience your role as an advocate for women's sports at NIU, not only at NIU, but also on the national and international level? First, have to follow Connie T. Berry. And just, it, you can't. I, I've been, um, I've been fortunate. My life has been very fortunate. That's how I feel my life has been for what I've been able to do. And I want to give you two words. Cause I'm in coach mode right now, so I'll probably talk too fast and I apologize. Uh, it'll be, my words will be opportunity and inspiration. And, and because of those two things, I think it will help summarize a lot of things that, that are going on. Yes, I am on this floor here with wonderful people. I do not look like them, um, but that's been the majority of my life as I've been a coach, um, to be in environments where I don't look like the other people that are there. Uh, and I played volleyball a long time ago. I was fortunate to be able to play at a place, and I've been coaching men and women for almost 30 years now in college. And people can say, hey, you can coach women or you can coach men. And the answer is, I could, and I have. And it's because of my opportunities. All the opportunities to get a chance to do it. Every place I had worked at before I came to NIU, I coached the women's team and the men's team. And it was cool for me to be in a gym for seven hours a day as opposed to being in an office for seven hours a day. Any coach will be okay with that. And then I was fortunate because of an opportunity for us a D who came to Chicago and, and recruited me to come here to NIU. And Carrie trusted D in the decision to, to hire me. That opportunity, I thought it was only gonna last me here only a few years and it's been 21. And I want it to be 22 and a lot longer. Again, the opportunities, the teachings from D as my sport administrator to teach me not only to, be a, to have a seat on the bus, but also know how to drive the bus know how to change the tires, helps me with everybody else that I'm trying to work with right now. Um, our, I know my sport, I know volleyball. And right now for volleyball, there are a lot of really good things that are going on right now. 
Volleyball is now on Linear TV, ESPN, which is a really big deal. Um, those opportunities help create inspiration for other people to come to watch volleyball at a younger age and, and maybe at an older age too. As we continue to move through it, um, all of those opportunities are, are massive for not only my sport to grow, but for everything to grow with, with athletics, women's athletics, just, just the building of things. Um, you know, and I go back and forth a little bit, you know, I talk about opportunity and inspiration. Again, the opportunity for me to coach here, but then to know people like Harry and Nadee and know how they impacted people were inspirations for me. And that's how I wanted to live my life to try to serve, along with how I was raised. I was an only child of a single parent. And what my mom has done for me, I, I, it says a whole other section, but that's an inspiration for me. Now, as we move forward, you know, I get a chance to coach, do things with USA Volleyball. I've, I've been to different countries. I've been a part of a, amazing experiences, again, because of my opportunities. I sit here now with, with one of my former players, and I'm either, she's either too young or I'm too old. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but, you know, and the people I work with, this is my work neighbor, um, and you just heard her story. Um, not only, she's just an inspiration in general. We joke about it a whole bunch, but, but for me to know when I come to work every single day and I have colleagues that are as inspirational as Coach T. Barry and all the people that are around is amazing. And the current group that I have right now is, 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 is incredible, um, but they also represent NIU Volleyball. So we've got Hoffman here being a newly minted Hall of Famer, which is awesome. But again, she reps, she reps NIU Volleyball. So there's a Hoffman, there's a Radke, there's a Kirsch and Grams, Roddy, a McCullough. All of those people are NIU Volleyball. She has her own story and it's an amazing one, but she represents that. Because of her opportunity, she's an inspiration. Just like everybody else here is in this room. If you've had a chance to participate in a sport, you should give yourself a hand because because of your opportunity, now you can inspire somebody else. And I'm hoping that my voice is not better than, but hopefully shows the level of pride that I have as a coach so that it can inspire other people later on because other people have inspired me. Thank you. Thanks, Coach. Kristen, congratulations on your Hall of Fame. That was fabulous the other night. <laughs> Like I said, big, big weekend for her, big weekend for her. I know, hold it together, hold it together, we got almost there. Um, so having competed at NIU 35 years after the passage of Title IX, talk about your experience at NIU, specifically how it prepared you for life after sport. Isn't that why we're all here? Attending Marquette Law School and also your career as a litigator at Adler, Murphy, and McQuillan in Chicago. Thanks, Deborah. Blame Ray for making me cry today. I made it through the whole weekend without a, a lot of tears. So thanks to Ray, I'm going to kind of tack on some of those words you said, opportunity and um, inspiring. And thank Ray for the opportunities that I had here at NIU and a lot of folks in this room, um, including my family, for being there along the way. Um, as we've all heard, Title IX is an educational law. And a lot of my experiences here at NIU and, and those after were because of the educational piece and i um, grateful that early on um, you all realize that athletics is a part of that. So um, experiences here, again, thanks to Ray, included going to the U.S. Olympics headquarters for a tryout and um, things like the NCAA tournament, which couldn't have been possible without um, all the folks who came before me. So. Thank you, ladies, um, on this panel. I'm so honored to be up here with you. I'm grateful that NIU has invested in us women um, to develop us to go out in the world after our time here and um, has helped me out tremendously. Um, I leaned on the skills and the lessons a lot during law school. Um, Ray and my teammates might get a kick out of this that there were many times where I'd ask myself, oh, is this studying situation or academic um, 
pursuit that I'm in, better or worse than our conditioning, the river. <laughs> and that became my bar at times, like, okay, if I could do that, I can do this. And um, I also realized that having failure as a student athlete um, gave me an edge in law school because I'd been through that before. And um, although none of us like failure, those were things that really helped me, that pushed me during the marathon of law school, um, the time management skills, the, the daily preparation, the, the habits that I cultivated here at NIU as a student and as an athlete um, in the pursuit for a bigger, bigger goal and, and a bigger dream. So thanks so much to volleyball for, for being able to do that. And then in my role today as an attorney, um, some of the things that people up here have talked about that I see um, in law school enrollment is now more women than men, but um, leadership is, is still uh, lacking, if I may go that far, is to say that there are still a lot more men in higher up positions. We are um, significantly lacking diversity in the profession, and I hope that the lessons that we've learned um, and the progress we've made with Title IX on the institutional side gets to the, the professional side um, because I know that I seek out mentors in the law um, and I'm grateful at my current firm that there are women partners there that I can look up to and um, seek wisdom from, which um, speaks to kind of like our team team here, having good women around you, um, men allies, people like Ray. Um, and then I'll just end with kind of the hard way mentality. Um, I've heard that a lot this weekend, but that really has helped me um, in my post-grad life. So grateful for all the opportunities that Title IX has um, enabled those of us and kind of the later generation. So thank you for, for the honor to be here. Go Huskies. Thanks, Kristen. All right, again, last but not least, you know, I wanted to have, we needed a current student athlete to represent the more than 100 women in this room, so no pressure. Um, you know, but after hearing the stories of the leaders on this stage, um, what are your thoughts on how far we've come in the past 50 years? And maybe a little bit of how far we have yet to go? And what can you do, your generation of students, your generation of athletes, kind of keep the momentum and protect this important part of our history? It's yeah. a lot of questions, Deborah. Um, you got this, Johnny, I know it. <laughs> a lot of questions. Um, but I want to say thank you. It's been an honor to like get to know the women that have been up here um, and to be a really small part of like the celebration of how far we've come. Um, I think the biggest change I've noticed, especially within the past few years, is the voices that have emerged. Um, you know, the U.S. Women's National Soccer Team got equal pay a little while ago. That's been huge. Um, and on the collegiate level, in 2020, I believe, there was a lot of voices that spoke up about the NCAA tournament and in the bubble and the differences that they've had um, between the men and the women's side. And I think maybe it was last year or the year before last that we were actually able to use the term March Madness, um, which is, seems like super small, but that's something that's like, you know, I think March Madness means to a lot of people, like, we're fun, we're fun, we're, you know, just because we play the game a little bit differently, sorry, play the game a little bit differently and it looks a little differently doesn't mean we don't work just as hard and we're not just as fun to watch, because um, I think we're fun to watch personally. But, um, so I think that's where there's a lot of people that are coming up and have a lot of courage to speak out. Um, how far we have left to go, I think it's awareness, really. Um, Coach Alexis Lawrence, who's our assistant coach, has done a really great job um, giving us knowledge on social justice and putting an emphasis on women in sport and our history. Um, I didn't know before a couple months ago that Title IX started because of academics. I thought it originated for sport. Um, and like the documentary Deborah mentioned earlier, 37 Words, which is on the back of our shirt, which is really nice. Um, they didn't allow women to grow academically, they didn't allow women to grow as people, in my opinion, like, that's insane. So, um, I didn't know it was for academics. So I'm getting my master's right now, and that's, I wouldn't be in that, and play basketball, I wouldn't be in that predicament if it wasn't, you know, for these women right here. So, um, 
we have a lot to grow there in awareness. And then how can we protect it? Um, I have a little sister, she's 15. She plays basketball as well um, at my old high school, which is really cool. Um, but I think just using my voice in spaces that I can, like I don't think I've ever asked her, do you know why you can play? Do you know why you're here? Do you know why you have this opportunity? Um, you know, I don't have the biggest platform in the world, but I like these spaces right here. Like I can be put in these spaces and I can use my experience and my voice. Um, and I think that's how we can protect it is using your voice when you can and not being complacent. Um, we cannot settle. I think the reason why we started the change in the beginning is because they didn't settle for what they had um, or what they didn't have. Um, so it's hard to see. We have come a long way and I'm like, oh yeah, I have these things, like I'm here, I get fed, I get to fly to games, like that's cool, but like what are the little things maybe I don't notice? What are the little things that I can speak up about? And it's like self-educating myself, you know, I think, like I said, Lex has done a really great job of educating us, but having your own self-awareness and doing that on your own um, is a way we can protect it as well, so. Thanks, Johnny. Yeah. Thank you. All right, one more round of applause for these amazing people. This was a heavy lift, but it was amazing. This is, this is great. Thank you. All right, we're going to transition to the next segment. So next thing. You can get down. You're done. Great job, folks. I think I need some help putting this podium back up. Yep. So this year, as part of the celebration of Title IX, our, our Mid-American Conference um, took some leadership roles, as they usually do in, in, these, in these areas. And um, they came up with the 50th, 50 um, women um, of the Mid-American Conference. Um, and so we had the fortunate opportunity to announce four women in our history, athletes. And I said, well, that doesn't seem like enough. And so I said, well, we should do 50. So we actually ended up doing 51, which I think is a great number too. Um, so I brought up Court Courtney Vincent up here to announce our, the women that are here from the 50 greats of the Title IX era. Now Courtney's taken on a leadership role that I've now departed. And so this is a bit of a baton pass. And she, and she ran track, right? So this is actually, that was a good one. That was for, you know, <laughs> sports analogy for you. Um, so she's going to take the leadership role here and announce the women that are in attendance today. If, if you're here, she'll announce your name and all the accolades. If you will please come up, take a picture with our president and our athletic director. We just want to memorialize this really super opportunity. And now, handing it over to Courtney. Let me fix this for you. All the 50 are here among us. Even if you're not here in person, we've put up all these uh, frames. Um, take a second to come up here. If you, student, particularly current student athletes, this is an amazing thing. 50, ama 51 amazing <laughs> women up here um, who really made their mark on NIU. So if you're in attendance today, this frame is yours to take with you. Um, but when you get announced, come up, take your picture. Thanks, Con. Hey, thanks, Courtney. All right, first up, Danita Dowdy, gymnastics. The first NIU gymnast to earn a postseason spot, Dowdy competed in the AIW, excuse me, AIAW Region Champions, uh, Championships as a freshman and went on to earn all MAC honors as a senior. Dowdy set the records on beam, floor, all around during her Husky career. Lori Fogelstedt, field hockey. A two-sport athlete in field hockey and softball, Lori set NIU records for career 
single season and single match goals, leading the Huskies to a pair of unbeaten seasons. She also played in NCCA selection and U.S. Field Hockey Association tournaments. Lisa Gilfoy, softball. Lisa of NIU softball won all Midwest honors four times and was all North Star Conference in three seasons. She led NIU in doubles, home runs, and RBIs in 1990 and 91, was one, excuse me, was on three NSC championship teams and a 1998 Women's, World, Women's College World Series team. E.C. Hill Basketball. E.C. Hill led NIU women's basketball to three consecutive NCAA tournaments from 1992 to 94. The two-time All-American, Hill was 1994 Mid-Continent Conference Player of the Year after averaging 22 points per game. She is one of just two NIU players in women's basketball history to have 100 steals in one season. Kristen Hoffman, Volleyball. <laughs> Hoffman was a two-time two -time COSIDA All-American and a 2011 AVCA All-American for NIU Volleyball Program. Hoffman was the MAC Setter of the Year in 2011 and two-time First Team All-MAC Pick. <laughs> Jill Justin, Softball. NIU's only female three-time first-team All-American, Justin still owns the NIU softball career records for hits, triples, slugging percentage, and on-base percentage. Her career 466 hitter, she still ranks fifth in NCAA, NCAA history and led NIU to the 1988 World College Women's College World Series. That's awesome. Ginny Cargis, tennis. the Mid-Continent Conference Player of the Year in both 1993 and 94 for NIU Women's Tennis. Jenny earned all league honors in those seasons while leading the Huskies to a pair of conference titles. <laughs> Ashley Morrow, Track and Field. The NIU Track and Field record holder in outdoor shot put and hammer throw. Ashley Morrow qualified for the 2007 NCAA Championships in the shot put and was a four-time NCAA regional qualifier in the event, winning the conference title in 2006. <laughs> Ann Mucci, soccer. <laughs> Ann was a, the 23rd player in NCAA history to join the 40-goal, 40 40-assist 40 club and finished with the school record of 129 Points. As a senior, Mucci was the MAC Player of the Year while earning All-American and All-Academic Honors. <laughs> Tammy Pytel, Softball. The 1997 All-American led the Huskies in hitting in 1997 and 98. Tammy won the two-time All-Region and three-time All-Conference player. A member of the 1996 NCAA regional team, her 74 hits in 1997 still ranks second at NIU. <laughs> Jenna Radke, Volleyball. <laughs> Jenna wrapped up her NIU volleyball career in 2016 as the Huskies' all-time leader in hitting percentage. She hit 341 for the for her career from 2013 to 2016. Racky hit 389 as a senior in 2016 and was named the MAC All Tournament Team. A three-time All America uh, All MAC selection, Racky was named to the AVC All Region Honorable Mention twice. <laughs> Mackenzie Roddy, volleyball. 
Mackenzie Roddy is the fourth all-time in kills in NIU volleyball history with 1,551. She was twice named first team All-Mac in 2013 and 14. Roddy was an honorable mention AVCA All-American in 2014, as well as a first team COSIDA All-Academic All-District pick. Hope Schmelzy. The NCAA qualifier in both cross country and outdoor track and field, Hope earned All-American honors in the steeplechase in 2017 NCAA Outdoor Championships, won three MAC titles, and holds a school record in the 800, 1500, and steeplechase. <laughs> excuse me, Beth Schrader, softball. Beth's career total of 68 wins, 334 strikeouts, a .98 ERA, and 113 games for our NIU softball. She went 24-6 in 1988 for the Women's College World Series squad and still holds the, the school record for wins and shutouts. Schrader was twice named All-Midwest and three-time co Academic All-American. Julie Sexton, so softball. A member, of, a member of NIU softball 1988 Women's College World Series team as a freshman, Julie went on to lead the Huskies in hitting in 1990 and 91. She earned an All-American and All-Midwest honors. She also was the North Star Conference Offensive MVP as a senior. Nikki Van Horwiji, softball. A third time All American in 1993, Nikki was a two time All, All Region choice with a career hitting average of 301. She finished her career ranked in the top five in three statistical categories and was a three time COSIDA academic All American. Allison Wade Shepherd, soccer. The second all-time leading scorer in NIU women's soccer history with 71 career points, Allison helped NIU Huskies um, to their first MAC title in 1997. She's a two-time all-conference all honoree and 1997 MAC Player of the Year. Kate McCullough, Volleyball. NIU Volleyball's career leader in kills with 1,936, Kate earned MAC Player of the Year after averaging 5.74 kills per set, which put her fourth in the nation. She, became, she also became the first NIU Volleyball player to earn All-American honors. Last one, Jennifer Van Alston, swimming. <laughs> Setting seven individual school records, five relay marks during her, during her career that included an All-Mac, Illinois AIAW All-State Honors, Jennifer twice qualified for the AIAW National Championships, becoming the first Husky to reach that level. Congratulations, ladies.
Thank you, ladies. Really wonderful. All right, about seven minutes over. That's pretty good. It's pretty good. Just in closing, uh, again, appreciate the opportunity to uh, celebrate with you all. It, um, this is a really, really big deal. Um, and for the current student athletes that are here, I mean, um, watching you all compete and play um, is just an honor. And um, I, I really will miss that piece of, uh, of the of day-to-day -day Huskies. Um, but, you know, these sports are on ESPN now. I've been watching it all the time, watching volleyball all the time, watching women's basketball, watching softball. Um, so continue to be doing what you're doing. The one thing I'll just mention, um, I was listening to a bunch of podcasts back and forth driving from West Virginia these past few weeks, and someone mentioned that, you know, the statement, it's hard to imagine something that doesn't exist. So when we were talking, when Dr. Kaplan came and, and, and told her story, you know, it, they didn't know what it needed to look like. And, um, but they sure did create something great. So again, thank you. And I think for what's next is, what John A. mentioned, you know, what, what really is next. It's hard to imagine what it is that will be the next steps for the progression of our opportunities here at NIU or Marshall or anywhere, right? So wherever we are. Um, I think Donna mentioned it, don't take your foot off the gas. Every day, think about it. Um, don't look away from it. And really finding those words that you mentioned, the advocacy, asking your, your sisters and your cousins and someday your daughters and what it means to participate in this really, really wonderful industry. You know, there's no, um, you know, Sean mentioned this week, there's no, uh, what do you say? Uh, she said something about daily preparation. There's no substitute for daily preparation. Thank you, sir. There's no substitute for daily preparation. And that's so key, and it's so key in this. Um, there's no substitute for thinking about it every day and really not taking your foot off the gas. Um, the women's basketball program, God love them. They have their shirts on today, more is possible. And maybe that's the theme we can carry for us to the next one. Like more is possible, whatever that is. I want to mention a little bit about your, uh, the content that's on your table. We talk about more is possible. There's QR code on your table that will direct you to a website where we have launched, NIU has launched the Women Enhancement Fund, Women's Sports Enhancement Fund. If you're able to give, when you're able to give, as often as you're able to give, please consider contributing to this super, super important fund. Um, this is for the extras. This is for the additional. This doesn't replace what we already do for our women's sports at NIU. It's on your table. You can use your phone to link up to it. There's also a super thing on the way out, if you didn't pick it up, is the Title IX coins. That's a super great memorabilia item. Thanks, Ryan Sedevi, for setting that up for us and getting that and pushing us across the finish line to have something as a takeaway for today. I hope you'll always remember this event. Connie mentioned it best. This shouldn't be the, we shouldn't celebrate only 50 years from now. So maybe 51, 52, 53, there we go. Um, and before I uh, close, I do want to send a special thanks to Alberta. Is Alberta still here? She, I know she's a, there, there she is. Thank you, ma'am. What a fabulous contribution you've made to this event. And Alex Doman as well. She's really uh, helped us quite a bit. There she is sitting up there. Hey, girl. Thank you. Um, we mentioned it before, once a Husky, always a Husky. That couldn't be more true. It couldn't be more true for most of the people in this room, and it couldn't be more true for me. So thank you very much for the opportunity to serve here, the opportunity to complete with this mission, and go Huskies.